When I was asked to consider loyalty and what it meant to me, I gave it a great deal of thought, and I came up with some truths, some things that I believed about loyalty and how it applies to Brookstone School. The first being loyalty is a wholehearted commitment, not a casual support. And you know, it made me think, why did the trustees, the founding trustees, choose loyalty, wisdom, and courage for the Brookstone Crest? You know, loyalty to one's alma mater is almost automatic or expected. But I think by choosing loyalty, those trustees felt like they needed something more than a casual support. They needed a wholehearted envelopment in this new idea of Brookstone School. It was just a brand new school that needed its board of trustees, its parents and its students to be behind it 100%. And so by putting loyalty on the crest and making it a founding principle, I think it has endured all these years. Another principle, a truth about loyalty is that loyalty is a faithfulness that is steadfast. Steadfast isn't a word that you hear these days very often, but it's a great word and one that I think we um, need to embrace even more. I'm so grateful that the founding trustees and the board members that have come after them and the school leadership have continued to stress loyalty and the other founding principles of Brookstone in the current mission statement. A final truth that I've come to realize about loyalty is that loyalty does not waver based on circumstance. That you're loyal to something no matter what is going on. Um, and I am grateful to Brookstone School for everything that it has given to me as a student as an administrator, as a parent, as a teacher, and now in my new role as a grandparent of two Brookstone students, I am delighted with the loyalty that's being instilled in them. Well, first of all, I want to say that I'm glad to be here this morning. I was uh, thinking it was 50 years ago when I first stepped on the Brookstone campus as a sixth grader, uh, and things have changed tremendously since that time. The student body's grown, the faculty has grown, the physical plant with all the new buildings and the amenities has certainly changed. But when I was thinking about talking about honor, I thought one thing probably has not changed, and that is that there's still a Brookstone Honor Code. And um, as I remember that code, and I'm sure it hasn't changed much through the years, is each student pledges to be, pledges not to lie, not to cheat, not to steal, and not to tolerate those types of things from their, from their fellow students. And I'm sure a lot of students, when they think about that honor code, they think that it's a list of prohibitions, things that I should not do, or I may get in trouble, may get suspended, may get expelled if I do something really serious. And when you think about the value honor, I think it's much broader than that. It's uh, something other than just complying with minimum standards and following certain rules that are do's and don'ts. Um, there are a couple of episodes that I thought about um, that illustrate this uh, when I was thinking about what the value honor means because if you just think about it generally it's hard to kind of pinpoint exactly what the definition is because it encompasses so many different characteristics such as being truthful, being genuine, being fair, being just. All of those things seem to fall under the value of honor. But to really bring it home, I think it's good to think of examples of people who have lived lives of honor and uh, who have been deemed throughout the 
history of being honorable people. And one comes to mind uh, in the Revolutionary War era. I have in my judicial chambers a reproduction of the famous painting by John Trumbull, who was a Revolutionary era painter. And he painted the scene in Independence Hall when the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were signing the Declaration, when they were pledging to support this separation from England. And when they knew the severe consequences of doing so, not only uh, the opportunity to create a new country of, that was based upon freedom and self-government, but also knew the negative adverse consequences that uh, they faced. And at the end of that Declaration of Independence, it says, and Thomas Jefferson wrote, that um, they would support this Declaration of Independence. And they would, in so doing, they would pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And Jefferson didn't add sacred honor just as superfluous language to the Declaration of Independence. It really meant something to the people of that day. Their word was their bond. And when they made a commitment to each other, that commitment meant something. They could each trust each other that they would follow through. And when they committed on July the 4th of 1776, that they would support the Declaration of Independence and all that it meant. And when they said they would do so upon their sacred honor, they were saying more than this is just something we've signed up for as a matter of convenience. They were saying that they were pledging themselves to each other, and they did. Uh, many of them lost their lives. A lot of them lost their fortunes, but I don't think a one of them really lost their sacred honor because they made that commitment to be true to each other and to follow through on what they had committed to. So to me, that's, that's one example of what honor encompasses. You have this code that you live by, not because you think that you'll get in trouble if you don't do these things, but it becomes ingrained in a part of how you live your life. And it's based on being truthful. It's based on being honest. It's based on not coveting your neighbor's property, working for your own property, and not cheating, not stealing, but it's a lot more than that. It's, it's living a life so that it shows that you respect certain important values. And when you do that, people will, I think, respect you as a person, a person of honor. Thank you first for asking me uh, to speak on wisdom because that presumes I have some to give. And um, a, a person who has wisdom uh, is a blessed person. And wisdom, we read, is more valuable than rubies and more valuable than gold. So it's a good thing to have wisdom. And the fact that you've asked me to speak on it says, wow, okay, uh, I'm honored. So thank you for that. And I think it's a good thing that Brookstone has wisdom as a core value. And that uh, speaks well of the school and uh, uh, sets a high standard along with all the other values that, that you have. So wisdom is a good thing. Um, as I think about it to me, wisdom means the use of knowledge in a good way the use of knowledge in a good way. And what that means, wisdom, the foundation of wisdom is knowledge. And we have to pursue knowledge all our life. We never stop learning. But wisdom is more than knowledge. Uh, I also uh, read about understanding and experience. All of those things go into it. Uh, the whole learning process but those are parts. Wisdom is the whole. And so you must pursue knowledge and you must gain experience and you must gain understanding. But the right use of all of that is wisdom. 
Now, where do you, you know, that, where do you find that? For me, I think I have to have a relationship with God. That's, that is the source of all wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I have to have a relationship with God for me to gain wisdom. I also have to have a relationship with uh, people I respect who share values, uh, who share life experiences. And so surround myself with people I respect. And so it's all relationship based, how I gain wisdom, how anyone would gain wisdom. First, your relationship with God, and then your relationship with others whom you respect. So I, I would, if I were challenging a student, I would say uh, to pursue wisdom like its hidden treasure because that's, that's what it's described. You, you should seek wisdom like you would seek uh, silver or hidden treasure. And we, and we know that hidden treasures is a hard thing to find. It's, it's not easy. So in terms of, of use of my time, I have to be careful what I'm seeking. And social media and all that's involved with that dominates our time. And that's, that's not wise. It has a place, but it's not wise to spend most of your time there. The same with watching uh, uh, movies or any kind of entertainment, uh, Hollywood especially. If you seek uh, wisdom there, you won't find it. Now, you'll, you'll be entertained. Uh, even if you look at our leaders in Washington, you don't see a lot of wisdom. You see a lot of uh, acrimony and division. Uh, you see power plays. Uh, so the world offers you a, a set of values that is skewed. It, it, it is not, it, it's not a good set of values because it's all about self and it's all about ambition and it's all about power. And so if, you, if that's your focus, uh, you, can, you can achieve and attain a lot of those things along the way, but it, ultimately you're gonna find it's empty and it's not lasting. And, it, and as, as is described in Ecclesiastes, it's all vanity. So I would say seek first wisdom. Now the byproduct of that, as we saw with Solomon, is he got riches and he got honor and he got all that stuff. But don't make the stuff your pursuit. Make wisdom your pursuit. I believe that when we think of courage, we usually think of like brave acts, um, you know, heroic acts of strength. But my experience at Brookstone certainly taught me that courage can come in very small ways. Um, I do remember being new and um, in many ways different when I came to Brookstone, um, or at least feeling different. And there was a student, Jill West, who came to came running to me just with this boundless energy. I can still see her, you know, floppy blonde hair coming up to me, the new kid, the only black kid, um, on that first day. And um, and in some ways I feel like that was courageous, you know, for her to identify this kind of unique, weird, quirky kid. And in seventh grade, who is not weird and quirky, right? Um, but for her to have the courage to just say, hey, this is a new kid and I wanna, I wanna get to know her. I think, those, I think that that is an act of courage, um, to seek out people who are different and to show them love. And that's what she did and I'll always be grateful for that. Um, 
I think that one thing I certainly gained from Brookstone in terms of courage is to, is to use my voice and to use it bravely, to use it with civility, but not to never ever be afraid to speak the truth. And I say the truth because I think that truth is absolute. Uh, but when you have this understanding that truth is absolute, you do have to be courageous enough to be generous to people who disagree with you. So in the public square, to have the courage to speak the truth, but to speak it with civility. And I got that every single day at Brookstone. If I could talk to Brookstone seniors right now, my first bit of advice would be to get over yourself. No one cares about what shoes you're wearing or the, you know, that you didn't get invited to senior prom. No one cares about that. And in time, you won't even care about that. But the things that you will remember and the things that you will care about are the fact that Jill West, in the middle of a sea of familiar faces, she came over to talk to the one new kid who looked different. Like, those are the things that you will remember. Um, and so I believe that courage is knowing what is the right thing to do and doing it even when it is unpopular, when it will cause you, you may lose friends, you may lose wealth, you may lose reputation, but courage is doing the right thing when it is terrifying. Service, the subject of service as a value of Brookstone is it's certainly one of the seven values that are listed in our uh, mission statement. And when you think about um, service uh, and look to that ethic, uh, what it says to me is that, you know, first, um, it is not natural for me to want to be, to serve others. And in fact, my natural inclination is to be self-serving and um, self-centered and self um, selfish. Um, that's, that's the way we are, and we, we can see it very well in other people. Sometimes we have a hard time seeing it in ourselves, but I've, I've proven it very well to my, myself that it is true. Uh, but it also, that ethic also says that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, we are to um, do unto others as we would have them do unto us, and that we are to give, um, uh, it's better to give than to receive, and give and it will be given to us, um, <clears throat> and that we find um, fullness and fulfillment and meaning and purpose in life in doing that. Um, there's, a, there's a proverb that says, the one who waters will himself be watered, and the idea is that the one who pours himself out uh, for others, who gives himself, uh, will be himself nourished and fulfilled, um, just as a, a plant would be that was watered and find life. Um, <clears throat> so we are um, surrounded um, with so many examples of um, service and serving in this community in particular. We have the, the uh, great blessing of having several companies that are, that are headquartered in Columbus that are um, national and international. We have Aflac and Synovus and Tesis and the Bradley Company. And you know, if you, if you look at their value systems and their statements of value and that sort of thing, at the heart of them, you will find serving and service and you know certainly they're all committed to uh, serving their customers but they make a, a, a lot of serving their team members uh, serving their uh, owners uh, but one, one thing that is pretty profound in Columbus is that they have done such a beautiful job of serving this community 
and you know we we would not be the same community uh, without what those organizations have done. We also uh, see so many uh, organizations that uh, exist to serve others. Uh, United Way is made up of um, numerous um, organizations that um, are filled with volunteers and donors who um, serve this community so incredibly well. And there again, we would, we would not be the same community without the many, many organizations like that that, that serve uh, Columbus. And so um, I hope that, you know, all of us in Brookstone and especially those that we're that are bringing along as students uh, will be the one that serves. Being given the topic of respect, I thought about it in several different ways. I thought about how we teach our children uh, to respect el their elders, to respect us as parents, and to respect their authority figures, their teachers, and anyone over them. But I also thought about how in your development, sometimes you're how you interact with the world depends a lot on how much self-respect you have and how as you move forward in the world um, you can't really expect other people to treat you any better or show more respect for you than you have for yourself. So I think part of that just means holding yourself out with some, some honor and what you expect of the world and then how you treat other people in the world. And I think it comes back around to you. Um, you know, I think we, we all are so much aware these days of the need to respect others who have a difference from us. Whether or not we agree with that, we, we, can, we need to understand that people grow up in different kinds of families. They grow up in different communities or countries or cultures or religions. And whether or not those are things we understand, we need to acknowledge that their experiences are as real to them as ours are to us and to have respect for them and after that, you can find ways to build bridges across those differences. By far, the, the most impactful part of my Brookstone experience, besides my friends, were the, the wonderful, wonderful teachers that I had. And I had so much respect for them, but when I think about the ones that really, really sparked a fire, it was, um, I'm thinking of Nan Pate and the respect that she showed for us. And she was always uh, bringing in leaders of different sorts to just maybe help us to lift our eyes up from our immediate high school circumstances out to the possibilities. And in that way, I think, she and, and a lot of the others who really served as inspiration had the ability to look at not who we were right then, but who we could be. And I think, you know, at the core of that was um, a respect for the fact that we were still, we weren't who we could be yet. I think at its core, respect means keeping in mind that when you meet somebody, Everybody has a story. Everybody has something that they love and care about. Everybody has something that they're afraid of. And everybody has something that they've lost. And if you think about that everybody is coming from their story, it helps you to see beyond the differences you may have with them and allows you to respect that there may be things about them that you don't know, but of those three things, that's something we all have in common. I love an opportunity 
like this to talk about really one of my favorite subjects and next to maybe faith and family, the subject of leadership is just at the top of my list because one, I've seen the impact of what effective leadership really produces and the changes that occur as a result of it. And I've also seen where it's uh, not effective. It affects everybody adversely in the team, the family, the organization, the whatever. And so uh, I have begun to believe over a long period of time now that John Maxwell's comment is so profound when he says leadership makes the difference. You have good leaders and good things happen. You have poor leaders and you're always pushing rope. You're always wondering why can't we get past this hurdle? Why can't we ring the bell? Why can't we cross the finish line? And so this subject of leadership is so critical. And to the young people that are in school and participating in the sprint, I would say learn everything you can learn about leadership. Read books, go to seminars, uh, listen to the people who are the best uh, at writing about it, talking about it, and even more so the ones that are doing it. Listen to them because it'll make a difference in your life. It'll make a difference in your job, success. It'll make a difference in your family, success. It'll make a difference in just the contentment you have as a, as a person, no matter what you're doing. And you might think, well, you know, I, I really am not a leader. I, I, I don't have anything to lead. But the definition of a leader is, do you influence other people? And everybody influences other people, which means that in that sense, everybody is a leader. And the more effective, the more skilled, the more uh, you are able to do it at a high level, uh, it'll mean success in your profession, it'll mean success in your family, and it'll mean a successful, fruitful, contented life generally. And so I'd just like to close by saying I can't be any more excited about what's going on in Brookstone with the leadership sprint. Uh, it's, I think it will fundamentally change this organization forever. And I pray that it will be taken seriously, that not just not just the leaders that are uh, sponsoring the training, but that every person in the administration, every person in the uh, faculty, and every person that is a student here will take it as, this is my opportunity to live an optimum life by following the principles that have stood the the test of time. Thank you.